Welcome to Booktopia TV. We're very lucky to be joined by one of the most exciting authors this year so far with a collection of short stories, Foreign Soil, Maxine Beneva Clark. Maxine, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Um, I was really, I should say initially that your publishers have just pushed this book out to the book selling uh, people, the establishment. They've, um, it, it's great that they've done it. And I, I was speaking to you earlier, I don't want to say that it was brave to publish it because every great piece of writing should be published and out there, but they've pushed it so hard um, and thankfully because it's just a wonderful, strong, confident taboo. Um, you must be stoked with how everything's turned out over the last few months. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really happy with yeah the way that it's been pushed out and the kind of campaign behind getting it out there and also with the way that it's been received um, so far by kind of critics and the reading public. Yeah. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about as well was initially, and this is kind of letting uh, the viewers into a little bit of the process of how we get to read our books, but the publisher sends out a galley, which is a little bit like an e-book, yeah. and we read that, and that's just very raw. That's, if they're excited, they just throw it on there and try and get us to read it. And then the proofs start coming in, and in that time, the order of the stories has changed a little yeah. bit, um, which I think is fascinating because I'm a huge <laughs> short story fan, but it never dawned on me, you know, in the same way I guess an album, that that is, you know, yeah. little things that happen. Can you tell us uh, the changes? Or, or yeah, well, we did talk about the, the order of the stories, um, kind of, you know, when it was getting to the proof stage. And I kind of had this thing that I wanted this particular story, Harlem Jones, to be first yeah. because it opens with this kind of young black kid just running. And so I kind of thought, you know, that's a real kind of bang. Yeah. Um, and the story I wanted to be last is called The Sukiyaki Book Club, which is about writing the collection. Or, you know, it's kind of semi-autobiographical. Um, and so I said, this, that's the only thing that I'm kind of definite on. Anything else can be moved around. And so I think the original copy that you would have got came out with Harlem Jones first. Yes. And then um, when we got to kind of the final book stage, um, my editor rang me and said, look, you know, we think there should be an Australian story first because, you know, it's a book by an Australian author and there's that kind of thing of, I guess, readers, you know, when you open this collection and it's kind of set in London. Um, and I guess from that point of view, it's also quite an abrasive story. It's a very abrasive know? story, yeah. So, yeah. you know, I can understand that readers who are not um, accustomed to, you know, voices like that, um, could potentially be deterred. So it's this real kind of um, toss up between, you know, this kind of artistic integrity, I guess. Yeah. I'm kind of saying, okay, how much does it really matter? But it's interesting because everybody who's read it the way that it is now yeah. loves it the way that it is now. Yeah. So it's yeah. kind of that thing of, you know, you have this set idea in your mind that, okay, well, it should be in this order. But, um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's been quite good um, to have it, and it also now because both the first story and the last story are set in the West in Footscray, yep. so I think it's kind of a nice bookend. I yeah. Guess. yeah, yeah, it is absolutely. And, and the really um, engaging part for me, and I, I mean, we'll go into sort of, I guess, the, the whole book as its own. But with the characters, it is very much the voice of the disenfranchised. There's a theme running through for me that that you can see there's chances everywhere around every corner, but it's nearly like a glass ceiling effect. Was that a theme, the major theme that you wanted to discuss through the Yeah, stories? definitely. Yeah. I mean, I guess each of the stories um, are kind of almost crossroads, you know, mm. like you kind of meet the characters at these points where they can either go this way or that way. Um, and I, I really love doing that as a writer, these mm. kind of pressure cooker situations where you have this character and, you know, maybe as a, as a reader you have that insight that, you know, well, maybe you could just do this and then you get out of that situation. Yeah. Um, but for that person, um, it's often such a kind of, they're so blinded um, or, you know, they're, they're so dispossessed, I guess, that they can't see their way out of um, where they are. Yeah. Did, did you, when you were writing, I guess, when you made the decision to write the short stories, was there any, because they're great characters and you feel, you feel like when you're reading them, I love short stories because you're very much in the moment. When you're reading a book, you might read it over the course of a week. And so the emotions that you feel are sort of uh, a little bit um, isolated and they don't all match up. Whereas a short story, every bang, you feel every, every punch for that one journey. Um, was there any, uh, any stories that you felt, you know, I can probably flush this out into something bigger or you were very sure that these were all belonged as short stories? Um, I think there's one particular story, Gaps in the Hickory, which is set yeah. in, in Mississippi. Yeah. Um, 
that I did feel I could write this story forever. Yeah. Um, and I think it was particularly the characters. You know, some of the characters I just thought, I just fell in love with them. You know, and I don't, that doesn't often happen to me with my own characters, yeah. you know, but um, yeah, so that was the only one where I kind of thought this is potentially, um, you know, could be bigger. But then I liked the fact that it stopped at this point where the reader was left wondering, well, what's going to happen in this situation? I like that kind of um, leaving a piece of writing, feeling like it's going to live on yeah. after you finish the story. Yeah, absolutely. And that's very much the key to a lot of your stuff. Mm. I mean, like you're saying with the Harlem Jones initially, I mean, yeah. it stops at the point where the action is about to begin, yeah. in a sense. And that's, that's the great thing, I think, about a lot of those short stories, mm. is there is this sense of there's so much after, but you are just asking questions as much as anything, because that's ultimately what these characters are left with. You know, their questions, the answers aren't that readily available, I guess, where they are. Um, you're an established poet. Um, your blog that I've been, I told you, I've been looking now, slam up, that's a plug for it, but um, <laughs> it's fantastic. It's a really wonderful blog and your writing's obviously, um, it's, it's top drawer, it's really incredible on that. Um, the decision to write the short stories over the long form novel, was it a pretty easy one for you? Yeah, it seemed like a logical decision. Yeah. Um, I was getting, with my poetry work, I found that I was getting kind of into longer and longer form. And whereas when I started writing poetry, my work was more kind of anthemic. You know, I'd be yeah. writing about a particular issue that I was out outraged about or it'd be a personal story. And I found that I was creating characters um, in the poetry. And so it just seemed a logical thing to do to extend it into a form that wasn't too long. So you still retain that kind of potential for poetic language yeah. Um, but yeah I found it a really natural progression yeah and, and in that blog as well there's a lot of references to um, to different music and, and things like that and how that inspires you um, if you had to put a soundtrack on foreign soil what was <coughs> artist do you think it'd be in there um, Gil Scott Heron okay, <laughs> the revolution yeah, will not be televised yeah, I yeah. think um, who else maybe Tracy Chapman yeah maybe that kind of melancholia um, a debtor. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe a bit of Ben Harper in there. Excellent, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, no, it is, because it's, it's still a very lyrical book. Even through all the voices that you use and things like that, um, you would feel, as you're reading it with no prior knowledge, that someone did come from a poetry background, because there are mm. just moments of, like you said, there's, there's anthems and themes running through it, but mm. it is still, it reads very much like. Um, there's a lot of patterns in your writing, and it's, it's, it's just absolutely beautiful. And uh, some of it is a kick in the teeth that I think we could all do with from time to time to know that there's, like you said, there's people out there in every street corner that are doing it tough that mm. need a voice and you've provided that. Um, so thanks so much for coming in. Foreign Soil, it's a cracking read, I can't recommend it enough. Thanks for coming to Booktopia. Thank you. And you can get a copy of Foreign Soil from booktopia.com.au right now.